slash and cast. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor Amy Pemberton about music, tap dancing, mimicking accents, Gideon, Legends of Tomorrow, voice work, and more. Also, a small caveat, Amy did experience some technical difficulties on her end, so it did cut our chat a bit short, but I've doctored everything up, so no need to worry, but that did affect our time together. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Multiple anomalies detected, Captain. It appears the entire timeline has been uprooted by all manners of monsters, madness, and magic. All current forces of action remain futile. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Why don't you just take us back in time to when you were a kid, you know? Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? <laughs> all of the above. Firstly, <laughs> your voice is incredible. Please tell me you do voice work. Oh I, my gosh. I do not, but you're like the third person to tell me that this week, interview you wise. You need to. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> can, you, can, you can you hear it when you listen back to your podcast? Can you hear it? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you really do. Your voice is amazing. Do it, do it, quick. <laughs> As a kid, you know what? My gorgeous granddad, my mum's dad, Granddad Jim, he was the most amazing guy on earth. And we used to sing together, like the village hall. I like do little routines together and stuff for the village. But I wasn't really into performing until like much later. Well, I'll say much later on. We took our next door neighbour because her mum couldn't take her to dance class. And I went and watched her do a ballet class and was like, I'm so bored. I don't want to do this. But then the next class, they were tapping. I could do all the tap, mm. the tap going on. Right. So I peeked through the window and I remember just thinking, well, I want to do that. So that's what I started doing first when I was about 10. I danced in a bit and then I did, it wasn't until I was about 16 that I realised I could sing. And so that's when I started to take it a bit more seriously and do competitions and then got the chance to go to a, a good college and auditioned and stuff. So yeah, it would, yeah. I, I kind of just wanted to work with animals when I was a kid, but I feel like that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's my most little girls. I want to be a vet. I didn't do it. And ended up, yeah, going down this route instead. Who were some of your personal favorite singers growing up? Did anybody influence your style a bit? We used to listen to a lot of older singers, like with my granddad. We'd listen to like Vera Lynn and Nat King Cole and like, mm. you know. And I don't know if that's where, it's not necessarily where my voice sits, but I have quite a, quite a deep voice and quite a mellow tone. And the Carpenters, they're like, you know, Karen Carpenter, incredible. So that's the kind of music I grew up listening to. My dad used to subject me to Dire Straits, which I actually love. <laughs> <laughs> so that's slightly different. And Sting, and he was a big Amy Winehouse fan, and Barry White. Like, oh, music's just the best. And all sorts of music, really. Just growing up listening to everything with different family members. and. Were your parents involved in the arts at all? No. My dad's sadly no longer with us. He died back in 2009. He was um, in the financial and computer engineering world, totally different. And my mom is a teacher, well, well, she's retired now, but she used to teach technology and child development and things like that. My brother's into cars, so no, I'm the only one that kind of went down that route. My mom's actually a really beautiful singer. She's in a choir and I love her voice. She's just, just not got a lot of confidence trying to get her to sing with me on something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mainly my granddad and my mum. So do you personally have a eureka moment that you can point to? Maybe a performance that you saw when you were young or something and you thought, man, I want to do that. Oh gosh, I did go to see a lot of musicals when I was a kid. I remember seeing Fame the musical and being like, I want to do that. I want to be up there. And I did musicals for a while. And then, yeah, I kind of came in and out of television work and, and musicals. Very lucky to kind of try and do a little bit of both. And as in England, back then, we seemed to get put in our box a little bit. So it was always trying to like do some theatre and then come out and try and get a play or try and get some TV work. So you weren't put in this box, which is bizarre because it's like everyone is working so hard to train to be an all rounder or a triple threat, whatever you call it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there was there was so many. I think there's so many moments, and I think you know, bless Olivia Newton-John. Greece as a kid was such a huge thing. It's just like, yeah, I want to do, I want to do that. You're the one that I want down the steps. Everyone was like, oh no, she's going to be a performer. <laughs> yeah, to this day, I can still pretty much sing every Greece song at the drop of a hat. So here's a question for you: 
Are you a Grease 2 fan? I am not. I really don't like Grease 2 at all. Just, you have to watch Grease 2, right? So on, um, I've loved that. I've loved both Greases my whole life. On Legends, me and Olivia, <laughs> we, we made all the girls watch Grease 2. We're like, you have to see this. We're asking all the cast and crew, like, have you never seen Grease 2? And they're like, no. Only like two people out of, gosh knows how many people were on that set had actually seen it. But you should, you should do it. It's good. Did you have a knack for voices growing up? Were you the class clown? Is that safe to say? I wasn't massively outgoing going as a kid but I used to go to a dance school and I actually saw this friend after a very long time only yesterday my friend Kim and um, we used to do like silly voices together all the time when we were kids because we were talking about it I was like oh yeah no we did used to really annoy everyone <laughs> doing like American accents and you know just just silly voices all the time so I'm like yeah no I did used to do that I just forgotten mm. annoying everyone around me <laughs> which accent is most difficult for you to do like just personally is American a little difficult for you to pull off I find the New York accent and those regionals really, really hard. I don't find South that, um, no, I do. I find it quite hard. I, just, I feel like the standard, we call it like the standard Americans fine. But yeah, New York, I find really tough. And Southern's fun though. I like Southern accent. Yeah, it's hard to find somebody doing like a subtle Southern accent. It's usually like, well, you know, you're yeah, trying to do it. <laughs> those YouTube clips you're trying to do for auditions. You're like, okay, well, I'm trying to copy it. Yeah. <laughs> friend from Birmingham, Alabama, and she's got a real, her draw's still there, but she's like, it's, it's it's not it's not crazy strong. It's a beautiful, she's got a beautiful accent. My friend Dusty, she's an actress as well, and she, she's just got. What was the catalyst for the initial jump to the United States? So I was doing a show called Rock of Ages, and I actually got really poorly on it. I had mono. I didn't really. I only ended up doing like the press night, and then I was really poorly after that, and I couldn't really do anything for ages after that. And I'd, I kind of thought about the states and, and wanted to try. Obviously, at this point, I was in. You know, I had it quite severely, and I was in bed for a really long time. Most of the things I was getting seen for before I booked the show was American TV shows. So my agent was like, "Why don't you spend this time getting all your references together, and let's try and go for your visa?" And so I used that time. That was kind of the real kick up the. You know, kick up the what's that I needed to like you know actually do it so there was that in that time and I was in bed and I couldn't do anything I was like trying to get my references together and I thought right he said go and recoup in the sunshine good place to you know California is a good place to recoup from something like that I was like well okay <laughs> credit carded everything it wasn't very sensible but in hindsight I guess but I was like just work it on a credit card and go <laughs> <laughs> and just try and get better and yeah explore the voice world more and yeah it was funny how that happened you trust those things in the end don't you You're like oh it was rubbish but right i kind of go well, maybe that was meant to be you know yeah i started out in kids television like doing more presenting work and i was terrible i was, <laughs> I was awful i watched some of it back it's so cringy i'm like oh no that's not good so i started in that world and then did some more kids television and then i think it wasn't until i was about 21 that i booked the lead in footloose with derek huff actually was playing opposite me which was lovely so that was back in 2000 yeah 2006 and i did jersey boys and then 2012 was rock of ages and then i kind of stepped back after getting sick was that initial jump to the united states was it a big culture shock for you or was it pretty seamless you know what i i i'd been out once to visit in in that time after getting my papers together to sort agencies out and managers out and so i did that trip for that so i'd kind of got an idea but yeah it was a bit of a shock moving i remember being I think I was staying in North Hollywood somewhere and I had booked a little singing gig over in Burbank and I actually walked the whole way. And it's just, it's, I do love LA. Like, it was just so different from England. I just got my little backpack. Oh well, I just kept walking and following my little GPS on my phone, but just like so dry. It was just so mad. Now it's just normal, but back then, you know, a decade ago, very different. So when you get a script, is it easy for you to, do you have any red flags, I guess I should say, like first page, is there something that you're looking for and you can tell if you like it early on? I think that, you know, I think the more I've done it, and, and I think back in the beginning, like if you have an instinct for good writing and you can, you, the minute you read a script, you're like, oh, this is so good. Mm -hmm. And there are some scripts that, you know, of course, like don't sit as well with you. And I guess it all maybe just depends on your own personal experience. And I don't know, but I do love it when a script comes through and you're just like, oh, and you just get excited by it. Yeah. It's very easy to learn. I think when it's really great writing, it's very easy to learn. It doesn't feel clunky. It just, you know, then you can really start working through like, okay, right. what do I want? What do I, you know, what do I need? What's in my way? You know, all the, all the things we go through with our little process of really trying to delve into a character. Yeah. Was it an intentional goal of yours to break into the voice acting world or was that it kind of just naturally happened that way? You know, I didn't really know much about it, but a friend of mine who actually produced Footloose, lovely guy called Jason Hay Gallery, he actually, when I wasn't very well, 
I'd done bits on it before on Doctor Who for Big Finish for BBC Big mm-hmm. Finish and uh, called me one day he was like look I think you'd be great for this role can he always doing this role it's Sylvester McCoy's companion I was like well, sorry what <laughs> okay I mean what do I have to do how much do I pay you and he was like Let, let's go like if, you, if you're ready to do it like we can start really soon I was like I'd love that and so I felt really lucky that at a time when I couldn't really do anything energetically like that, I couldn't be on stage I definitely couldn't have been on set there's no way back then and so that's kind of where it kind of really started to grow through that I was so lucky to get that job did that for a really long time yeah it was brilliant I'm getting my, my timeline confused I'm thinking you know, I did start it and then I went back to do some more so it was kind of in between that I wasn't well but yeah that was kind of the, the kickstart for it really and then when I moved to the States I think just being because I'm obsessed with accents and I've been I, I love studying accents Scottish and Welsh and Irish I think I'm lucky to be in a bit of a niche with my agents so oddly enough one of the only Telltale games that I've played is the Game of Thrones one How did that opportunity come about for you? And were you a fan of the series or TV show beforehand? I actually became more of a fan afterwards because I hadn't honestly seen it. I'd seen bits. I hadn't kind of committed to watching it at that time but I, I'm after that I definitely started to kind of delve into it some more but that was just through my agency yeah an audition came through and I read for it which is different from the UK which I always find really fascinating not all the time but in the UK you tend to have all your reels up on your your site on your page you know with, through your agency and you kind of get more direct bookings whereas in the States I find that you'd always audition um, you'd always get the script and you just you know submit which um, I used to really enjoy actually just to see all the scripts come through so yeah it was just through through my agency and I, I auditioned for it, it was really Really fun really fun job lovely people how long were your recording sessions for that one i did it for quite a while i remember it it would depend on how much i guess we had to get through on the day but i think with voiceover they tend to only really book you for four hour sessions max but i don't ever remember being in there for four hours i think it was probably a couple they have to do four hours and then break it's a while ago now that was like 20 God, that been like 2013 i think isn't it that just seems like it? you know four or five years ago when it's pushing a decade now Oh my gosh, don't. That's terrifying. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're right, isn't it? Because we're 2022. Yeah, that's... that's that's scary. I've never seen this series. I'm not familiar with it, but it looks right up my alley. Can you tell me a little bit about Suspense? Oh, Suspense is so fun. Or just John who writes and produces and does everything there. Really, just really fun, quirky stories and, and kind of mystery stories or haunting stories. Yeah, murder mystery stories. We always have a lot of fun in that studio when we go in. I did quite a few of those and a lot of my friends were involved which was really fun and definitely worth a listen listen to them some very talented voice actors on there and actors you know we're all the same is it like an audio drama yeah God, yeah yeah so it's definitely I mean I love audio dramas yeah really fun and they're kind of just like standalones as well awesome I'm definitely gonna check those out so Amy let's talk Legends of Tomorrow was that a right place right time situation or a typical audition what a mad, I mean, I can't know where to start with it. I, I think I did a rush call for it just for the voice way back in 20, I think it was 2016, it must have been. I had to do it on my phone because I wasn't by my equipment and I just remember, all I remember is it was a rush call. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember just like diving somewhere like under something that would cut out the sound and just put in an audition like, Captain, we are in 19, whatever. And, uh, and it was a really short audition and uh, I didn't think anything of it, didn't hear for a while and then all of a sudden my agent called me and was like, oh, you booked that that thing. I was like, what thing? <laughs> that Legends of Tomorrow thing. I was like, why is that going to be? Because it was there wasn't much information on it. I didn't really know exactly what we were doing. I thought it might just be a one-off or a one episode. I was like, no, I think you're like you booked the voice of the AI on it that's amazing great you know and then then we started to learn more about it and I was like oh this is not I didn't realize this was a, as big as it, as it was and, it, and you know like getting to know and I'd already knew David Rappaport because I've been in for things on camera heaps and it wasn't until season two where they kind of decided to bring her in in person and that's when that kind of journey began yeah mad for a voice job to turn into to turn into that you know yeah were you given much direction for the voice at all or did you just kind of nail it Funny, so Jeff Jarrett, um, exec producer on the show, and he was my voice director all the time. He, um, we played it back, we played my audition back, and for some reason, I know my voice has gotten a lot lower as I've gotten older, but the original audition is very high pitched in comparison <laughs> to what he's ended up being. It was, I can't even, I, I must ask him for a copy of it. But he was brilliant because I'd be doing other other jobs, you know, and doing different accents and different tones, and sometimes we'd have to kind of sink back into it if we haven't done it for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, no, let's back and try, to try and match what we decided on he was a fantastic director and so fun we had such such a laugh so i'd be like jeff i don't feel like we're quite there and then you know as as long as i did it for longer it was just in in me at that point but yeah to start to start the first few episodes i was a little late to uh legend of tomorrow i'm a huge uh john constantine fan so hey. once once he once matt ryan started sort of joined on i had to catch up but i loved it 
Oh, that's amazing. I even, no. uh, let me just show you how big of a Constantine fan I am. Hold on one second, sorry. If you can see my oh. arm, I have. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's an incredible tattoo. The, did you watch Constantine before he before it came onto Legends? The TV show? The yeah, 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 yeah. The NBC show, yeah. So at what point did the showrunners start to toy with the human form of Gideon? So that came about in season two when you know, the Rip and Gideon storyline in Land of the Lost. And they'd kind of talked about it, and I, I just thought, well, how are they going to do that? Because that's a bit mad, isn't it? Like, how are the writers going to get that in? And, you know, I used to like, just go and see the writers, and, you know, I'd bop Brown to the studios and say hi, and I've got some lovely friends there now. And just, they always talked about it. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how are you going to manage that one, you know? But they did, and, and that's the first time it happened in season two. And then they were saying, we'd love to kind of do it every year and just keep it a surprise so the fans don't know when it's going to happen. But it always become like a, Gideon's going to pop up at some point you know yeah 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 and yeah they, they talked more and more about like bringing her on more but i just i never really look into the you know bank on those things until there yeah but i wasn't expecting that i wasn't expecting season seven to be what it was at all like it came completely out of the blue for me which was really exciting and a challenge of you know but wonderful yeah so lucky unfortunately legends uh is coming to an end after a great run so what experiences from that show are you going to carry forward with you throughout your career Oh my goodness, there, there was a moment like in, I mean, every time I went to the, the show, I just, I feel like, you know, that whole thing, Canadians are just so friendly. <laughs> like, it was such a lovely experience in terms of cast. You know, not every job I've been on has been quite like, you know, it's been some interesting experiences, some more difficult experiences and like anything in life, right? But right. Um, yeah, it, I just, everyone just got on. It was, you know, we're like, oh, are we going to find this again in our careers? Like, it's very easy, very easy time and just very lovely. And then we worked really, really hard. I think there was a moment in 703 when I was having to do all the stuff with, you know, Gideon and Evil Gideon and just that whole experience is one of my first big days on set and Katie Lotz was directing, she was fantastic. And um, I just remember thinking, this is nuts. Like, this is, <laughs> this is nuts. Like, what is happening? Like, talking to myself and, you know, just felt really grateful. And um, I'll always remember that moment. I was like, this is, I just, you know, you have those moments, everything kind of slows down a little bit. And I just went, oh, God, I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. I loved it. Really, really cool. And, and I mean, numerous moments like that throughout the, you know, throughout the season, just with everyone when we finally all got together in season uh, episode five. And, and there's a lot of laughing. Oh my gosh, the the end was bizarre because we all kind of had sporadic days on set. Yeah. So one of the the last scene we all shot together was, gosh, was two days before I actually wrapped. So um, Olivia, Laseth and I ended it was a three, which was really lovely because we'd started in that way. And our last, the whole last day on set was with, with us three girls. And then the whole, I didn't get to, I mean, I saw Nick, but I didn't get to like be with Nick on his last scene and Donald. But yeah, it was bizarre. We kind of all thought, you know, we were coming back. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Like, oh, no, nah, it'll be fine. We'll see you soon. We'll see what happens, you know. So I didn't really feel like a proper, but not you know, proper goodbye. You know, it's never goodbye. It's just seen you know, a minute. Yeah. And I hate that that happened to that show because it seemed like out of all the remaining CW shows that Legends still had the most momentum, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so, I mean, such a wonderful show for, you know, the messages that it puts out and I think that's very important. But, you know, they did it and it was there. Our fans have just been incredible with, you know, all their support and it's really overwhelming that show. I didn't realize. I mean, I knew there was a big fan base, um, but they've really been something else. Amy, is there a voice that you've done in your work that was a bit harsh on your vocal cords that perhaps one you'd rather not do again? <laughs> 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 there are numerous games I've done in my time, which I'm not just saying I can't remember the name of them. I guess they didn't do as well. I'm trying to think. You often get like, it will say, this is going to be vocally stressful if your client doesn't want to submit, you know, don't submit. But I'm like, I'll submit it. Like, definitely. You know, I feel like having trained as a singer, I know how to look after my voice. But there are some times when, if you're really shouting for four hours, like... <laughs> It was a game, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a lot of shouts. Very, very vocally stressful. And I remember coming out, literally not being able to speak. And I was like, oh, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> so done so well there. I was like, quick, drink some throat coat and have some lozenges. But yeah, I can't remember the name of it now, but oh, yeah, it'll come to me. Do you yeah. have a regiment as a, someone who uses their voice a lot? Do you take any extra precautionary measures in terms of vocal exercises or tea or anything like that? I try and do a lot of warming up before I go in, especially if it's gonna be vocally stressful. There are some some things that if it's just mellow and nice on your voice and you're trying to get a certain tone, there'll be certain exercises I would do to like you know, sit in that area. So yeah, like a good, a really good warm up. 
and I should fall down more than I do, which is always people going, call down after a voice thing. I'm like, yeah, you know, yawning and doing all your, like, bring your larynx back in the right position and all of that. Tea, tea is good, throat coat, dreamy. So what's the best acting advice you've received in your career? A couple of things, I think it's easy to say live, live in it, listen. I have worked and been part of and trained at an amazing acting studio for a really long time called MC Squared and um, Mario Campanaro runs it, fantastic coach, an amazing actor himself and yeah, I've been part of that for a really long time and it wasn't really till I went to him that I kind of really started to understand more actually, you know, because in the day we're just observing humans and human behaviour and that was that was what was kind of a big thing when it came to Gideon, I called Mario going, this is nuts, like I mean, I know how I'm going to try and do it but I've got to try and bring this character who's already you know appeared but bring her to life but she doesn't know what it is to feel or to do certain things and how like how does she listen how does she copy how does she observe he's like yeah it's all in the listening right you've got to really listen and, and be very watchful for her to learn for the, those things for the first time I was like yeah this is like creating something from scratch but which is a good challenge you know right and the more you know what the more you do all your work on it your your all your backstory, or you know, your given, your given, your given circumstances, all of that work, and I actually tend to really enjoy going voice noting it as you know, I feel this way about this, or you know, how do I move? How do I see the world? How does how do people see me? When you really delve into properly doing that work, is when you can let all that go and just kind of live in it. And there's not as much anxiety because you feel like, no, I know, I know this, I know this world that I've really delved into. I think that's when you can really let loose and just just live in it. I just talked to uh, an actor, uh, Brad Greenquist, the other day, and he pretty much said the same thing. He said, you know, the point of going on to stage is not really to hide yourself, it's to dissect yourself. And I really liked that way of phrasing it. Yeah, wow, that's right. Revealing thing to do, I think, being an actor. I know it's always like you're trying to be someone else. Well, you are portraying, you know, being, but there's always kind of a part of you in that, right? So it's, and it's your own experiences you can draw on. Of course, some things you're not going to have experienced in life and you have to, as if, or you have to, you know, really think a different way around certain things. But it's it's very revealing. I just went to see Jerusalem. Oh my goodness, Mark Rylance. I don't know if you've ever seen this play. Oh my gosh, I have never seen anything like it. And it's just everything that you study and you and you, you try and do yourself. Like you, when you see that kind of masterpiece up on stage, like I don't think I've ever been so excited watching a play. And I came out, my friend Nicholas Pinnock was outside and I said, that was nuts. And he's like, I don't think I can ever act again after that. <laughs> and I was like, I know, what are we even trying to do? It was just a, oh, just from the get go. And it's just a real, gosh, what's the word? Just an incredible example of someone who's just, is that character and you just can't take your eyes off him. And it was a three hour play and it went by so fast. Imagine. It was called Jerusalem? It's called Jerusalem, yeah, by Jez Butterworth. and. Um, they did it 10 years ago. Barry Sloan's in it as well. You know, Barry. And, you know, numerous fantastic actors. Oh, yeah, it's just phenomenal. And they did it 10 years ago. And then they're doing it now. And he's saying he'd like to do it in another 10 years. So 10 years time. Come to Britain and watch <laughs> this incredible man. It's, uh, it was quite life changing watching that from an acting perspective. Yeah. Do you have any desire to get on stage yourself? It's always something that I, I never wanted to say anything out loud. I think, you know, you never want to put anything out there where people go, oh, she couldn't do that. Like I had to have a lot of anxieties from being poorly back then, which must sound crazy. I'm very lucky that I got better because I know a lot of people don't after something, you know, when it's a severe infection like that. But yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I would like to try and do. The thought of it does make my palms sweat a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I've been to hypnotherapy and you know, I do miss singing. Singing on set was fine. Like I don't, anything on set, I think it's um, singing live. I'm trying to ease myself back into that more with doing, putting some more music out. And But you know, that's just the real truth of it, isn't it? You know, you're just a human and you've got some anxieties and I'm like, why am I ashamed of saying that? I just got to work through it. I do go and see shows and I think, oh, that's a world I used to love. And I've just got to work through some stuff, I think. Yeah. I hope you <laughs> do it one day. It Thank you, love. I'm going to try. I know it must sound really silly to some people, but I don't know. It's just a, oh, it's a weird, weird, weird thing. My brain goes, oh, I can't do that. Slowly but surely. <laughs> Baby steps, right? Baby right, steps. right. <laughs> so, so, Amy, have you seen any movies that have moved you recently? Well, if I, I've watched a lot of series recently. Mm. I just... Um, I haven't watched, what's the last movie I watched? Oh my gosh, what am I talking about? I went to see Elvis the other night. What am uh, I talking about? Austin <laughs> was just, oh, he was incredible. Have you seen it? I've heard great things. I have not seen it myself though. Oh, he's fantastic. 
and so is the beautiful actress who plays Priscilla. I've just been looking her up. She's amazing. Australian, isn't she? Australian girl. That that was what I just watched and thought, oh my gosh, he's just killed it. But yeah, I'm mostly watching series. I just, I'd read the book, This Is Gonna Hurt. I don't know if you've seen this. I think it's on BBC, Ben Wishaw. It's a fantastic series. Um, so I've just finished that. And Elvis. So that's what I've just watched. <laughs> what have you just watched? I've watched Prey on Hulu. I don't know if that's up your alley, but it's the new Predator movie. Oh, is it good? It's very, very good. It's probably the best since the original. It's, oh, wow. Okay. It, I think it's the number one movie out right now, and they didn't even release in theaters. It's, oh, uh, oh, incredible. Okay. Just to wrap up here, Amy, not going to keep you all afternoon. Is there anything on the horizon for you that you can tell us about without getting in trouble? <laughs> I might, well, I actually had an email yesterday about going back on a game that I've done that's quite a big game, which I didn't think we were doing any more, but I don't know if I am allowed to say what it is. I don't understand. That I just went, oh, I don't know if I can actually say that yet. So just so I don't get in trouble. But it's a game that's been out for a long time and I actually thought it, we were done, but no, I'm going back to do something on that. And I've actually been waiting. I keep checking my phone. I'm, I'm waiting on something today, which can't say what it is but yeah there's been it's been very quiet and then all of a sudden there was a couple of things that popped up so we will see but it's friday i'm like no oh, it's 20 to 6 on a friday i think it's a goner oh no i think it's a goner guys oh, but we no. keep trying eh? the life of an actor <laughs> <laughs> i haven't done that in a while i was like am i pitched that right oh no, you still got it that's so funny yes i love it well amy you have a great rest of your day i appreciate you for giving me some of your time no worries love you to chat to you stay cool i will all right (laughs) bye bye now (laughs) bye bye love all right folks that's a wrap i hope you enjoyed that chat with amy as always you can find us on all your social media platforms just by searching monsters madness and magic once again thanks for listening And we'll see you back next week. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine. A treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.